I came across a couple of editorials in uh, Adventist reviews in past years. This one started out some months ago. We received a letter from Bobby. We don't know how old Bobby is, although we suspect Bobby is a teenager or a young adult, nor do we know whether Bobby is a man or a woman. Here was the letter. One question has persistently bothered me to the point where I can no longer keep quiet. It is a question that I believe is fundamental to my life. I ask you this question. I am asking every professed Seventh-day Adventist, what is a Seventh-day Adventist? And more important, why are you a Seventh-day Adventist? I think that's a question we need to ask more than we do. We need to know who we are. We need to know what our purpose is. We need to know why we exist as a called and covenanted people. When Jesus died on the cross of Calvary, salvation was assured for every individual who wanted to accept his life and death in their place. Now, how many Seventh-day Adventists were standing around the cross that day? I mean, card-carrying Adventists with 28 doctrinal beliefs? Not a single one. God got the job done of saving individuals through the life and death of his son, Jesus Christ, without the need for a single Seventh-day Adventist. He didn't need us for that job. He got it done without us at all. We've received that as a gift from others. And then when Jesus ascended into heaven 40 days later, began his high priestly ministry, began a ministry in the heavenly sanctuary of sharing the benefits of his salvation to all who would accept, how many Seventh-day Adventists were there in that upper room praying for the descent of the Holy Spirit? Not a single one. God got that job done without us as well. He didn't need Adventists for that. So why are we here? We aren't here because he needed us to give the message of salvation. That has been done by countless others before us. We're just doing the same thing as others have done. Why did he call us into existence? We're going to look at some Bible texts this morning, without which there would be no Seventh-day Adventist church. They're very familiar texts. Turn to Revelation chapter 14. And of course you recognize this immediately as the passage of the three angels flying in heaven. And in verse 7, the first one has a message. Revelation chapter 14 and verse 7. Saying with a loud voice, Fear God and give glory to him, for the hour of his judgment is come, and worship him that made heaven and earth and the sea and the fountains of waters. Now, what is the time period that this text is referring to? The hour of his judgment is come. What time are we talking about? That's 1844, isn't it? About what time was the Adventist church being called into existence? About the same time. So could it be that our existence has something to do with this time period and this issue in the history of the plan of salvation? You see, the battle has been going on for a long time. Satan has been challenging God at every step. He has said in the beginning, God's law is unfair, God's character is unjust, I can do a better job of running the universe, give me a little more say. And the battle has been waged on this earth. Who is right? God or Satan. And you know where Satan got his best arguments against the character and the government of God? Not out there in the Philistine world. Not over in Moab or Edom or even in Babylon. You know where he got his best arguments that God's way doesn't work? Among his chosen people. Satan could point to those people that claim to be the covenant people and said, look at them over there in that, uh, in that grove worshiping their idols. Look at them over there wanting to be like the nations around them. Is that really your way, God? Your way doesn't work. Look at them. His best arguments came right from God's chosen people. Things got so bad that God had to, to give a chance for his plan to work, to send them all into captivity. Destroy the city, destroy the temple, that beautiful temple. We have no concept of what the temple of Solomon really looked like. Artists have a very hard time describing that temple. 
and it was just raised to the ground. Nothing left. They couldn't worship God in any way off in this foreign country in the way they'd been used to doing it. We're going to look at the book of Daniel now. Things were really bad in the time of Daniel. Daniel chapter 8, one of those texts without which there would be no Seventh-day Adventist movement. Daniel 8, verse 13. Daniel is in Babylon with the rest of the captives, and here is what he saw. Daniel 8, verse 13. Then I heard one saint speaking, and another saint said unto that certain saint which spake, how long shall be the vision concerning the daily sacrifice and the transgression of desolation to give both the sanctuary and the host to be trodden underfoot? That's a long and complicated question. Let's simplify it. How long will Satan be winning the battle? How long will your way be trampled underfoot? How long will this go on? We're in captivity. The temple is destroyed. Will it be forever? Will he win the battle? That's the question. I'm very glad for the next verse. Verse 14. And he said unto me, Unto two thousand and three hundred days, then shall the sanctuary be cleansed. What is God's answer to the question, Will Satan win? His answer is simple. Satan will be defeated. That's the answer. But he says, Daniel, you're going to have to be very patient. This is no quick fix. The arguments are very strong that Satan is bringing. It's going to take centuries, literally centuries, millennia, to work this out. You'll go to your grave, Daniel. It'll be long past your lifetime. But there will come a day in which Satan's arguments will be thrown down forever and Satan will be defeated. See, this word cleansed has some interesting meanings in the original language. It can mean set right. It can mean vindicated. It can mean cleared of charges. It can mean justified. It can also mean cleansed. All in one Hebrew word. What is said, being said here is that God's way will be vindicated and Satan will lose. That's the answer to Daniel. Now let's look at another text in the New Testament. Romans chapter 3. It's a very interesting text, one we don't think of that often. Romans chapter 3 and verse 4. When we think of judgment, we usually think of us being judged. But look what this verse says. Romans 3, verse 4. God forbid, yet let God be true, but every man a liar, as it is written, that thou mightest be justified in thy sayings, and mightest overcome when thou art judged. This says God is being judged. The most remarkable thing <clears throat> I can think of in this whole battle between God and Satan is that God is saying the issue will be decided not by my declarations but by my explanations and when I explain and demonstrate who I am and what Satan is I'll let you be the final judge you will decide who's telling the truth that's what God is saying what a remarkable God we serve who will put himself on the line, the God that is omnipotent and omniscient and has control of the entire universe is saying, I will let the beings whom I have created determine if I am worthy to remain in charge of the universe. Finite beings like you and me make that decision. And here the plea is that God will overcome when he is judged. Hated God's name very well, won't we? He demonstrated the character of his father. He showed what God was really like. He demonstrated what Satan was like. But you know, I found some interesting statements. Here is a statement in Review and Herald, April 16, 1901. All heaven is waiting to hear us vindicate God's law. All heaven is waiting to hear us? You mean Jesus didn't have the final vindication of God? All heaven is waiting 
for something else to happen, for God's vindication to take place? Here's another one. This one is, uh, ye shall receive power, page 338. The honor of the law of God is to be vindicated before the unfallen worlds, before the heavenly universe, and before the fallen world. What is necessary? That the honor of the law of God is to be vindicated. That was Satan's challenge. God's law is not good. It's not fair. It's not reasonable. We don't need it. We can decide for ourselves. God's law must be vindicated. Testimonies, Volume 5, 746. If there ever was a people in need of constantly increasing light from heaven, it is the people that in this time of peril God has called to be the depositaries of his holy law and to vindicate his character before the world. Interesting statements. We today, living today, are called to do a special mission called the vindicating of God's name. Again, take your Bible. Turn back to Revelation chapter 14. Before the three angels fly with the final messages, a group of people is described in the same chapter. Sometimes we forget about that group of people. We just talk about the three angels. Revelation 14, verses 1 to 5, describe a very unique group of people. And in verse 5 is an incredible statement. And in their mouth was found no guile. That means hypocrisy deceit for they are without fault before the throne of God a people without fault a people with no guile a people that God calls into existence to proclaim the three messages are we wondering sometimes why the three messages don't have the power that we hope they would have maybe it's because the people aren't quite the people God needs just yet and maybe this people is the key to the success of the three messages that are described here. So Revelation 14 is an important chapter. Ellen White puts it this way in Desire of Ages 671. The honor of God, the honor of Christ is involved in the perfection of the character of his people. What's at stake here is not my honor. It is not even my salvation. What is at stake here is the honor of God. Can he pull this off? Can he really produce a people like Revelation 14, 5 describes? Is that possible? The whole Christian world says it's impossible until the second coming of Christ when suddenly, I guess, God will push a magic button in our brains and we won't be sinning anymore. But that's not God's way. God never does that. He never treats us as robots or computers. Will there ever be a people that will prove that God is telling the truth in Revelation 14 verses 1 to 5. Will there ever be that people? I think it's very significant that Ellen White calls this the final atonement, which is the final part of the atoning process. Without this part, the atonement cannot be completed, even though Jesus died on the cross as the most magnificent demonstration this world has ever seen. I have found that uh, there are interesting ways that we can prove or disprove God's arguments or Satan's arguments. Here I found this in Desire of Ages, page 309. All who break God's commandments. Well, now how many of us does that include? All of us? So all of us are sustaining Satan's claims that the law is unjust and cannot be obeyed. Thus they second the deceptions of the great adversary and cast dishonor upon God. You know what sin is really all about? It's really not about whether I go to heaven or I go to hell. Sin is about casting a vote. When we deliberately do what we know is wrong, because our selfish natures say, do it anyway, we are saying Satan's way is more logical, more reasonable than God's way. You know that very hard command of Jesus, and it was a command. When someone comes up to you and strikes one cheek, saying something very bitter against you or whatever it is, doing something to you that is totally improper, what are you supposed to do? 
turn the other one to him so he can have another whack at you? That's totally unreasonable. That is not right. If I do that, people will just walk over me like a rug. Satan, you have more on your evidence on your side than God has in making a statement like that. That's a hard statement. A hard statement to live with. Do we believe that God's way is right, that turning the other cheek is the way to solve the problems of being insulted? Or do we believe that Satan's way is right? You stand up and give as good as you get. Who are we voting for? Who are we saying is right in the great controversy? That's what sin is all about. Every time we sin, we are casting a vote for Satan to just run this world a little longer. It's okay, Satan. We kind of like your way. In Great Controversy, page 489, if those who hide and excuse their faults. Ah, uh, now the second part. How many of us have done that? See, it's one thing to do something wrong. And then what do we do next? Almost immediately, we try to cover it up so that no one will know. Or if they do find out, we blame it on someone else or something else. Some of us even blame it on Adam. So we cast blame on someone else. If those who do that could see how Satan exults over them, how he taunts Christ and holy angels with their course, they would hasten to confess their sins and to put them away. Did she say there, <clears throat> if those who do these things would realize that they're going to hell quickly, they would hasten to confess their sins? She didn't say that, did she? See, this is not about what happens to me. This is about what happens to God. Will God be true when he is judged? Romans 3, 4. And she says, if we could only see how much we need our eyes open, when we cover up our sins, when we excuse our sins, how Satan just rejoices over us. See, they're doing it my way. And how he throws this in the face of Christ saying, look, your way doesn't work. Watch them right now. Look at Adam blaming Eve. Look at Eve blaming the serpent. Look at every one of your children blaming someone else. It's all the me game. It's someone else's problem. It's not your way doesn't work, God. If we could see that, if we could see Satan and Christ in that little dialogue, she says we would hasten to confess our sins and put them away. Because we are dishonoring God. We are giving Satan credibility. We are giving Satan permission to run things a while longer on this planet Earth. I found another interesting statement. This one from Testimonies, Volume 2, page 171. If you could see how much we need to see, my friends, we need to get our eyes off this earth and onto the realities. If you could see the pure angels with their bright searching eyes intently fixed upon you. Now, what are the bright searching eyes of God's angels fixed upon you for? To find out all the wrong things you're doing? No, listen. If you could see their searching eyes intently fixed upon you, watching to record how the Christian glorifies his master. That's what they're looking for. They're looking at you and me wanting to see the votes that we are casting for God. Finding everything that they can find out about how we're doing it God's way. Or could you observe the exulting, sneering triumph of the evil angels as they trace out every crooked way? Those are the ones who are looking for the sins. And then quote scripture which is violated. The evil angels. The evil angels look for the sins in our lives, then compare the scriptures with our sins and throw it in the face of Jesus Christ. And they say, look, there they are. Your way doesn't work. If you could see that, she says, you would be astonished and alarmed for yourselves. Not because you're going to hell, but because you are enabling sin to reign on this earth for a good while longer. That's why we should be alarmed. Because we are casting votes for Satan. This is voting time. It has been voting time for a long time in the great controversy. And we are voting for who we think is the right way to run this planet.
Those are some very significant statements. We are part of the process. We are part of the decision-making process. Came across some uh, interesting and disturbing statements. This comes from the Biblical Research Institute of the General Conference. A friend recently spent three weeks on an Adventist college campus. During his visit, he taught a class and spoke with scores of students. His most disturbing finding, he told me, was that most had no concept of the Adventist church as anything more than one of scores of evangelical churches. Each church, a student told him, emphasized some aspect of truth. The Pentecostals emphasized spiritual gifts. The Baptists emphasized baptism by immersion. The Adventists emphasized the Ten Commandments. Yes, God has a church, but it is scattered throughout all the churches. A remnant church? I'm glad our Adventist pioneers weren't alive to hear it. Do we believe that we have a special purpose? Or are just, we just one of many with different purposes that God is using all about the same? The previous editor of the Adventist Review said, Remnant has become a four-letter word in some Adventist circles. Even some pastors would be happy if we quietly laid it to rest. And then he said it's time to rise in defense of this long-standing Adventist idea. To abandon it will cast us adrift in a wash of relativism. Those Adventists who want to ditch the remnant concept need to think long and hard about what it means to be Adventist. We are not just one more denomination. We are a called and covenanted people, not because we are better than others, but simply the Lord in his freedom simply gave us a job to do. But now more than ever is the hour for Adventists to know who we are and why we are here, and that means that one thing, the remnant. Do we believe that this is the remnant of Bible prophecy? Do we believe that this is the reason for our existence? The editor of our Sabbath School lessons put it this way. Today, some among us even assert not only that we are that different from other churches, but that we shouldn't be. After all, if we don't have something unique, something better to offer, why not be like everyone else? Despite those voices, many among us still believe, and rightly so, that God raised up the Seventh-day Adventist church not because he wanted just another denomination, but because he has given us something different, something better to proclaim to the world. If he hadn't, what justification do we have for our existence? And what he has given us are crucial, distinctive truths that make us Seventh-day Adventists. Not Lutherans, not Episcopalians, not Baptists, not Methodists, but Adventists. Seventh-day Adventists. These teachings make up a distinct message that no one else is proclaiming, and because no one else is, we have to. That's, in fact, why we're here. Do we believe that? Do we believe that we are here because of that crucially important issue? <clears throat> you know, the coming of Jesus Christ <clears throat> is not dependent on when Jesus wants to come, believe it or not, because he would have been here a long time ago. Two times in Adventist history were the times Jesus chose. The first time about 10 years after 1844, if the Millerite movement had not fallen apart in discouragement. The second time around 1890, when God sent messengers to prepare his people for translation and had his prophets support those messengers. That's when he wanted to do it. There is a reason that we're still here. I don't know if uh, a number of you have listened to this man or heard his tapes of old time. His name is W.D. Frizee. He comes from a place not far from here, Wildwood. Passed away, of course. But he said something very important that I want you to hear. Whether his people understood it or not, he could go to the cross and make it plain later. Isn't that what happened? What individual on earth understood what was happening at the cross? And Jesus had to explain everything later, even to his most trusted disciples. Then in 1844, whether anyone on earth understood it or not, he could move from the holy to the most holy place and explain it all later. Not one person on earth understood what happened on October 22, 1844. And he had to explain it all afterwards. But he can't close his work in the most holy place and explain it later because later would be too late. 
See, never before in human history has there been a universal close of probation. There was one close to that called the flood. But you know the eight people who survived that, some of them didn't do so very well after the flood, did they? But there has never been a universal close of probation in which the doors of forgiveness are closed forever. So if Jesus waited until after he left the most holy place and then told us what he was doing, no more forgiveness now, it would be too late. We would not have a chance to make a decision. Now we see why the bridegroom has tarried, why time has continued on since 1844. Jesus has slowed his pace that he may walk with us. This can't be like the cross when he went ahead without his church's understanding. This can't be like 1844 when he moved as the prophetic clock struck the hour. This time the clock will not strike until his church is ready. Is that why he called this movement into existence? To put the final piece of the puzzle in place. To put the last arguments against God's character out of the way. To disprove Satan's last statement that the law can't be obeyed. We will show that it is good and it can be obeyed and God is right and Satan is wrong. And therefore the great controversy can come to an end. Is that why we're here? Wow, what a role to play in the whole battle that started with Lucifer in heaven. The final decision point is why he called us into existence. Well, let's change our gears for just a couple of minutes right now. What was the purpose of Israel? Why did God cause, call Israel into existence? To get as many Israelites into heaven as possible. Was that it? Or was Israel supposed to be the lighthouse of the world? Was Jerusalem supposed to be the place where if anyone wanted to know about the, the great Yahweh, the creator of all the universe, they would come to Jerusalem for information? Remember there were to be highways built from all parts of the world to the great capital, spiritual capital of the world, Jerusalem? Those were the prophecies in the Old Testament. Israel was to enlighten the world about the character of God and the great controversy. How'd they do? Well, you know the story. Not so well. Not so well. So now, why did God call, God call the Seventh-day Adventist church into existence? To get as many Adventists in heaven as possible. We've got 16, 17 million right now. Maybe the magic number is 30 million. Then it's done. Or are we just like the Israelites of old? That God called this movement into existence so that anyone who wanted to know about the real God in heaven, not the false versions, the real gospel, not the false versions, the real truth, not the counterfeits, they would come to this movement to understand God. Isn't that why he called us into existence? And now how are we doing? How are we doing? We like to think we're doing very well, but sometimes statistics tell us different. Polls have been taken in past years, some interesting polls that, uh, that uh, reveal some things that we like and some things that we don't like so much. This one was in 1986, Gallup poll. They found that 70% of the respondents said they have heard or read about the church. 70% of the people they polled said they've heard about Seventh-day Adventists. When asked what they like best about us, 52% left that line blank, 21% said nothing in particular. Then they asked another question, what do you like least about Adventists? 51% left it blank, 20% said they didn't dislike anything in particular. How are we doing, folks? Another poll was taken in 1995. This time, slightly more than half ever heard of our name. Not 70%, but just a little over 50. And a marked increase in the number who misidentify us with the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints or Jehovah's Witnesses. Well, once again, uh, how are we doing? Part of this uh, uh, survey also 
uh, the ones who have heard of us, the 53%, were asked what contribution the Adventist Church makes through community service. I think every one of you has heard of ADRA. ADRA goes out where there is a disaster or where there's a need in the world, tries to help the people. That's our community service, plus our Dorcases in our local churches. And so the, these people who knew about us were asked what contribution we make through community service. Nine out of ten said they hadn't a clue. Ninety percent of the ones who know about us said they don't know anything that Adventists do that helps the community. They haven't heard of ADRA, apparently. And so even our best efforts to uh, get the message out of what we want to do don't seem to be accomplishing it. Another survey in the major cities in North America, 66% of their populations don't know Adventists exist in the major cities. 66% don't know we exist. Only 15% know that we're a religious group. Hank Hanegraaff is a radio broadcaster who knows quite a bit about Seventh-day Adventists. And he was asked one time, what is your take on Adventists these days? Listen to his answer. It depends on which Seventh-day Adventists you are talking about. The denomination has become so diverse that one group bears little resemblance to the next. Whoa. Whoa. If that is even remotely true, what kind of job are we doing in conveying the truth about the character of God clearly to the world? when you have to say, well, this is one brand of Adventist, and that's another brand, and then there's another one over there. And they're all a little bit different from each other. Okay, so in realistic point of view, the statistics tell us that we're not getting the message out very well. We're just not doing what we hoped we were supposed to do. Ellen White says in Testimonies to Ministers, page 50, through the church, through the church, eventually, will be made manifest the final and full display of the love of God to the world that is to be lightened with its glory Amen. through the church, which means we've got some preparing to do. We've got some changes to make. We have got something to do. Now, since the church is struggling, and we have to be honest and say it's not as, as God intended it to be, the temptation is easy for us to say, oh, let's just forget all this stuff that's going on in the church. Let's just go out there and witness to those that are willing to listen. Let's just do Bible studies. Let's just do something where people are interested in hearing, not where they're arguing and fighting and all this stuff that we see in the church. It's tempting. Now I ask you, when Jesus Christ was trying to come to a people that were three years away from being rejected totally by God as his people. Where did he spend the majority of his time? In Syrophoenicia? In Edom? In Moab? In the countries around Palestine? Or did he spend most of his time and energy and ministry with his people, trying to restore them to the position that God had intended for them so they could go out to the world with the message of God. Jesus did not abandon his hurting people who were three years away from being rejected. He tried with every energy of his being to restore them to their place in God's plan. And I'm suggesting we learn that lesson. We need to be restoring, not ignoring. We can't walk away from the problem. The problem is us. We need to be healing our problems. We need to be bringing us, uh, ourselves together. We need to be unifying under the banner of truth. Not falsehood, but under the banner of truth. We need to be doing our best to heal the damage Satan is doing, even among the Seventh-day Adventist church. Now, I came across another interesting statement, this time from a former conference president. So it's not coming from someone who is in any way attacking the church. It is coming from someone who is very concerned about uh, promoting Adventism. He said, music is made up of three parts, melody, rhythm, and accompaniment. All three are essential but are not equal in importance. The melody should have the most prominent part and should not be overshadowed by the rhythm or the accompaniment. Now what does that have to do with Seventh-day Adventism? Melody, rhythm, and accompaniment. 
the evangelization of the world by means of extensive preaching, teaching, and printed material, and the expenditure of large sums of money for campaigns, buildings, equipment, and travel, vital though all these are, do not in and of themselves fulfill the principal commission entrusted to the remnant church. These are not the melody. At the most, they are the accompaniment. And these days, I'm hearing this is the melody. Get the message out, share the message, global mission, whatever it is, that's our mission. And this man is saying, no, that's only the accompaniment. The melody, which is to ring forth sketchily at first, but ever more clearly, is the song of victory over sin. The song of Moses and the Lamb, soaring higher and higher, closer and ever closer to the heavenly pattern, further and further away from the world, to the climactic height of a full and final display of His grace in vessels of clay, but divested of all earthliness and testified unto by the declaration of the angel, here is the patience of the saints, here are they that keep the commandments of God and the faith of Jesus. For the first time, this testimony will be said of a whole community of saints. For the first time. Well, we aren't there yet, my friends. That's the melody. And could it be that the accompaniment is not going so well because the melody is off, off key? The melody isn't there. And then he said, let Laodicea be warned. At one time, David fell victim to the magic influence of numbers, that Satan-inspired sport which so slyly leads to pride and self-complacency, which so trickishly substitutes quantity for quality, mediocrity for true merit. The charm exerted by number, size, and quantity, if allowed to prevail, will fill Laodicea's pews with illegitimate children and swell her ranks with a mixed multitude, which as of old could bring her march to a standstill at another Kadesh Barnea. God forbid that such a thing should happen. What did a leader of the church just tell us right there? That evangelism carelessly and improperly done can destroy our movement because of this magic, magic influence of more numbers. It's called church growth, which seems to be all we hear about or think about right now. Not heart growth, not heart surrender, but more numbers, etc. The um, director of the Biblical Research Institute you know, we, we are very grateful because we don't have all the success we'd like to have in North America in evangelism. If we have an evangelistic series and 10 or 20 people are baptized, we praise the Lord. But in overseas countries, a hundred, a thousand are baptized at one time, and we say at least the work is going forward there. At least there is progress in the third world. The biblical research director said this. He said, what I think is one of the most important issues has to do with new converts. You see, the growth is so rapid that it's very difficult to keep up with it. Because of the speed, we, think, we need to really think for a moment about the dangers. And the danger I'm going to mention is a real one. It's the danger of baptizing individuals coming from a different Christian tradition or a non-Christian background who are not well informed about the biblical message. They receive a brief introduction to the Adventist message and they're baptized. There is little follow-up. These people are Adventists based on the little they've come to understand. They retain some of the ideas they brought in with them because they've never understood Adventism well. Doctrinal and theological diversity is finding a place within the local congregations. That's a real concern by one of the leaders of our church saying we've got to be more careful than we are. And even in North America, we're beginning to have that problem. As I hear people coming to me and saying about some of the subjects I talk about, I've never heard that before. That was never explained when we had baptismal studies. And so we begin to have this same problem addressed by a number of leaders of the Seventh-day Adventist Church. Do we understand our mission clearly? So what I'm simply trying to say is that the primary purpose of the Seventh-day Adventist Church, the reason God called us into existence, is very simply to vindicate his name and prove Satan a liar in the great controversy. That's it. Whether I get saved or not is an interesting question, but not the real issue at all. The real issue is who wins the great controversy. 
Where am I casting my vote? Am I putting it on the side of hastening Satan's defeat or extending Satan's reign? If I succeed in that, I succeed as a Seventh-day Adventist in proving that God is right. Now, the secondary mission of Adventism, once we understand our primary mission, is sharing this good news with everyone who wants to hear. It's called evangelism. It's called Bible studies. It's called witnessing. We share what God has done for us individually because we can't keep it to ourselves. But if we turn it around and say as long as we're doing outreach and as long as we're doing evangelism, the other will somehow magically happen, it's not going to happen. We've got to keep the horse and the cart in proper perspective. The horse pulls the cart. The cart doesn't pull the horse. And the horse is victory over sin because God is vindicated only in that way. And that pulls all of what Adventism is, if that's understood properly. Well, my friends, even if some of us don't get our mission very well, even if some of us think we're here to be saved, and that's why God is here, why, why God sent Jesus to, to save us, to forgive us our sins and to give us a ticket for eternal life, even if some of us don't get our mission very well, Satan knows. Satan knows what's at stake. He knows that if this movement succeeds, his days are numbered. He knows that if this movement can be derailed or delayed, he gets a, while, a good while longer on planet Earth to run the show. He knows that. He is very clear on it. And by the way, just one little thing. How many of the movements God has ever called into existence have succeeded in their mission? How many? Israel? How about the early church? The apostles took the gospel to the whole known world at that time, and then what happened when they died off? Fell apart. Went into apostasy. The Protestant Reformation. Glorious. The lights began to shine, and what happened? Not one movement that God has ever called into existence has completed its mission. It died away or it compromised or apostatized. And Satan says, the track record is on my side. I'll get this movement too. That's the issue at stake. Satan is trying to derail this movement and he has a lot, had a lot of success. And God is saying, I'm going to pull this one off at the end of time, like no other movement has ever done in human history. That is a big order. And God has set himself the impossible job. All he needs is our cooperation. That's all he needs. He doesn't need us to do the job because we can't do it. He needs us to cooperate with him. Let him work in us. Let him empower us. Let him do impossible things. And then we'll see what happens. Who will win the battle? So I'm going to say that Satan is laying some careful traps to deceive God's people. And our last text today is going to be Ezekiel chapter 33. Ezekiel 33. I hope you realize that most of these prophecies of the Old Testament were just as much or more for us than they were for Israel. And this is one of them. Ezekiel 33. So thou, O son of man, I have set thee a watchman unto the house of Israel. Therefore thou shalt hear the word at my mouth and warn them from me. Warning message coming up. Go down to verse 10. Therefore, O thou son of man, speak unto the house of Israel. Thus ye speak, saying, If our transgressions and our sins be upon us and we pine away in them, how should we then live? We're always sinning. Things are always coming up. We don't do as well as we should. We continue to sin. How will we survive? Say unto them, As I live, saith the Lord God, he's basing it on his existence as God. I have no pleasure in the death of the wicked, but that the wicked turn from his way and live. Now who are these wicked ones? Ah, the next two words. Turn ye. 
Yes, you are the wicked ones, my chosen people. Turn ye from your evil ways, for why will ye die, O house of Adventism? I don't think I misread that text. I don't think so. We are the modern Israel that God has called into existence. And he has no pleasure in our destruction or our failure. That it will not please him at all. But that the only hope for us wicked ones, let's be honest, for us wicked ones is to turn from our evil ways. We have to make some hard choices. Will we continue to let culture dominate our choices day by day in the activities we participate in, in the things we read, in the things we listen to, even in the foods we eat, my friends? Will we continue to let culture rule our decision-making process? That's why Israel was destroyed, for that one reason alone. Culture overrode the Word of God. We're in just as much danger right now. And right now, God is appealing to us to turn back before we fail as a people. Now, Satan, as I said, knows what's at stake here. And Satan is laying his traps well for every Seventh-day Adventist because if he can get us to fall or to delay or to be careless, he is given a lot more time on this earth. First trap of Satan is just plain old worldliness. My, there's a lot in this world that is attractive, isn't there? Go to the Internet. There's just a ton of things that are fascinating, exciting, and some of them very improper, but are also very tantalizing. On the Internet is a world of information that we can spend all our time with. Even with the good things on the Internet, our lives can be swamped with our little chats in our chat rooms and things that we are just very interested in saying something about someone else to worldliness and then there are just plain the cares of this world I mean making a living is tough and how much time do we have left for God so trap number one is the world and its cares for those who are not going to let that happen we're not going to be trapped by the world we're not going to go down that road Satan says fine Come to church regularly bring your Bible study your Sabbath school lessons get involved in church activities, become a part of the church, go out and give Bible studies, do it. Become a really solid Seventh-day Adventist Christian. Just understand that the way of salvation isn't quite what somebody is trying to tell you. God is not arbitrary. He is not going to abandon you when you make mistakes. So God will accept your mistakes. It's okay. God loves you too much. If you sin, God understands it's already been taken care of by the cross. When you accept Jesus Christ, it's all finished, and you have a saving relationship that can't be taken away from you no matter what. Just understand that a little sin is allowable in God's plan. It's okay. God is merciful. You can be a Christian. You can do a good job as a church-going Christian, Adventist Christian. Just understand that the gospel isn't quite as strong as you thought it was. God will love you and accept you no matter what. A false gospel. Trap number two. Cheap grace. Saved in your sins. It's okay. For those who are not going to be trapped by that imitation of the gospel, that counterfeit of the gospel, Satan has another plan. Those whose eyes are wide open and are not going to go down that road, a cheap grace gospel. It's the um, see how bad they are perspective. Look at what the conference is doing. Look at what our pastor just said. Look at what the church decided to have in their worship services. Look how bad the church is right now, how apostatizing they are. There is nothing good in them at all. Them and that, and that, and that one and that one and over there, look how bad they all are. And we point the finger constantly at the ones who are bad people in the church. It's the spirit of criticism I'm talking about here. There must be a pointing out of the problems, yes, but how do we do it? In the spirit of Christ or in the spirit of Satan? 
a bitter spirit, an angry spirit, always critical, seeing nothing good. Third trap of Satan. He doesn't care if you're caught in the ice of indifference or the fires of fanaticism, my friends. Any way is good for him. Number four. I think it's of all the traps. Most of us don't like to be extreme. Right wing, left wing. We want to be balanced. We want to be middle of the road. We want to be seen by people as moderates. And you know about the only way you can accomplish that in the Seventh-day Adventist church of today with all the things that are going on is very simple. You come to church. You sit in your pew on Sabbath morning. And then you leave church and you keep your mouth shut. You don't talk to anybody about anything significant. Certainly not religion. Maybe you can talk about the weather. Yeah, that's all right. But you don't talk about anything relating to salvation or doctrines or truths because you might be labeled. You might get someone to say, he's A, and then a name be put behind you. So you just keep your mouth shut. You can talk to your wife a little bit, that's okay, but no more. You know what Ellen White says? The worst hostility against God is neutrality in a crisis. Amen. You know, that's what really, really brought World War II into real prominence. Are you fully aware of that? Is the British government under Chamberlain wanted to be neutral. Don't take a stand. Don't de worry about what's happening over there in Hungary right now. Don't worry about Czechoslovakia. Uh, we just, we're over here. Neutrality in a crisis is the worst thing in terms of the great controversy because we're not voting at all, we think. Yes, we are. We're voting for Satan. Neutrality in a crisis is the most dangerous trap right now for Seventh-day Adventists because if you do speak out, your neck is on the line and somebody is going to try to take it from you. Four traps, worldliness, false gospel, bitter spirit, and neutrality. Satan doesn't care which one of those work with us. If it works, he wins, and Adventism is no longer going to be successful. And God says, please don't let that happen. Please turn from your ways before it's too late. My friends, let us have our eyes wide open to the great controversy in heaven to the vote that we are casting by our lives, to our purpose as living on this earth as Seventh-day Adventists, and to the trap Satan is laying for us. If we do that, yes, there's still hope that this Adventist movement may become the remnant of prophecy who actually do keep the commandments of God and have the faith of Jesus. May we be that people. May we not experience the failures of the Israelite people that God tried with the first time. May this time Satan be totally defeated. That's why we're here. And then we get to go home. It's that simple. It's not profound. May God help us to be Seventh-day Adventists.